Assalamu alaikum, good morning, hello, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Sarah's Digital Twin and IR 4.0 in conjunction with Hari Profession Technical Nigara. I'm your host, Shari Arwani, alongside my colleague, Dr. Hafiza, and we are live from KICT IIUM. We are glad to have you all tuned in. Dr. Nomazia is unable to join us due to unavoidable circumstances. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease her situation. Digital Twin is a hot new emerging technology space, but I promise you this is a real thing and modeling is at the heart of it. It kind of seems complex, but that's why we are here today. We have in our midst three experts who are going to help the country steer through the new industrial revolution, IR 4.0. Let me quickly introduce our panelists. Prof. Muhammad Riz Zawahiddin, Vice Chancellor of University Saints Science Islam Malaysia, Dr. Mazlan, CEO of Favorite or Favor IoT, and our very own Dr. Rizal Muhammad Noor from KICT. A warm welcome to all three of you. Our panelists come from diverse backgrounds. Prof. Riza is a well known figure in cybersecurity and quantum computing. Dr. Mazlan has been a strong pop proponent of industrial IoT in the country. And Dr. Rizal has been extensively focusing on cloud and IoT research. If your friends and family haven't joined in, now would be the time to send that WhatsApp. We are live on Facebook. If you have any questions for our panelists, please shoot it on Facebook and we will be glad to answer. Thank you, Dr. Sharia, for the introduction. Uh, kami sekali lagi sangat mengalu-alukan kehadiran semua peserta dan panelis ke sesi webinar kita pada hari ini. Seperti yang dimaklumkan tadi, sesi webinar ini adalah bersempena dengan Hari Profession Technical Negara 2020. Bertemakan masa depan adalah kita. Sambutan tahunan ini adalah anjuran bersama agensi-agensi di bawah KKR. Tujuan sambutan ini selain daripada mengiktiraf sumbangan profession teknikal kepada pembangunan negara, Ia juga adalah untuk memberi pendedahan kepada masyarakat tentang bidang teknikal itu sendiri. Dengan itu, tanpa melengahkan masa, uh, kita akan mulakan dengan soalan pertama ditujukan pada yang berbagi Prof. Eh. Bolehkah Prof berkongsi sedikit latar belakang dan bagaimana uh, minat Prof uh, untuk menceburi dalam bidang sains dan teknologi ini? Terima kasih Dr. Fiza. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi semua. Uh, minat terhadap sains dan teknologi ini datang daripada awal lagi di bangku sekolah. Dan satu faktor saya rasa membantu saya mencebur diri dalam bidang ini ialah uh, filem dan kartun-kartun uh, science fiction. Ultraman, hmm. ya, yeah? uh, benda macam Star Trek. Jadi benda tu dia memberi saya gambaran bahawa orang sekarang kata thinking out of the box. Memang masa itu kalau tengok, memang thinking out of the box. Nak mencari idea-idea yang uh, tak tak yang tak apa nama ni dapat pada masa itu lah. Uh, bagaimana Prof boleh uh, terlibat dengan uh, quantum computing tu sendiri Prof? Oh. Sebenarnya bila habis uh, masa dulu dipanggil SPM sekarang SP, uh, dulu MCE sekarang SPM so ditawarkan untuk keluar negara so diberikan uh, pilihan beberapa pilihan dalam bidang sains teknologi jadi saya memilih nuclear physics pada masa itu tapi hmm. macam mana pun dia tak ada nuclear physics yang ditawarkan di UK masa itu yang secara apa ni khusus bagi program lah sarjana muda. Jadi saya ambil fizik. Daripada fizik tu saya mula berminat tentang perkara berkaitan kuantum lah, kuantum fizik. So di situlah mulanya uh, pencabahan idea-idea dan minat uh, dengan kuantum fizik. Okey, terima kasih Prof. Uh, tak sangka ya daripada cerita-cerita yang macam uh, animasi, macam Ultraman tu semua boleh mendorong ke arah bidang sains dan teknologi ni. Ya. Yeah. Okey, menarik sekali. 
soalan seterusnya, soalan yang sama juga kepada Dr. Mazlan Seperti yang kita semua sedia maklum, Dr. Mazlan ni adalah antara pemain industri yang tersohor di Malaysia Bolehkah Dr. Mazlan berkongsi bagaimana uh, latar belakang Dr. Mazlan dalam menceburi bidang sains dan teknologi? Okay. Pertama kali saya mengucapkan terima kasih kepada uh, IUM lah, kerana menjemput saya Uh, macam uh, mana Prof Riza kata pun dia ada punya background tu melihat kartun kan uh, Saya ada cerita lain juga lah okay. Okay. Uh, Bidang karier saya memang dah selama ni dalam bidang elektrik dan telekomunikasi lah eh, Semenjak saya uh, graduate daripada UTM tu Bila saya keluar saya sebagai seorang akademik dan dalam bidang telekomunikasi tu sendiri Sebab master saya adalah bidang met- uh, telematics, telematics uh, dipanggil data communication. Itu adalah minat saya. Dan apabila saya keluar daripada akademik, masuk kepada industri pun dalam bidang telekomunikasi, uh, minat saya masih lagi mendalam dalam R&D, uh, meneruskan uh, usaha-usaha R&D di uh, sektor telekomunikasi itu sendirilah. Uh, kemudian saya keluar masuk kepada MIMOS pun dalam wireless te- technology. Jadi benda itu tak, tak pernah lari daripada bidang teknologi sebab uh, minat saya memang amat mendalam dalam bidang teknologi itu sendiri sehinggalah uh, masuk kepada red tone membuat satu bisnes dalam IoT itu sendiri sehingga uh, umur saya agak lewat sikitlah untuk menceburkan di dalam usahawan uh, memang dalam cita-cita kita tidak pernah fikir untuk menjadi seorang usahawan ataupun seorang CEO uh, saya punya resume dahulu pun setakat nak menjadi seorang CTO uh, Chief Technology Officer tapi kalau nak katakan minat tu datang daripada mana ialah uh, saya masih ingat lagi uh, ketika saya masih kecil uh, saya pun agak heran juga bagaimana bapa saya seorang yang kerjanya sebagai seorang kerani just normal clerk uh, di di di, uh, di sebuah uh, kerajaan tapi tidak ada uh, secara formal mendapat kursus untuk membaiki televisyen ataupun barang elektronik tapi saya lihat di belakang rumah saya tu dia setiap kali ada waktu apa kata waktu dia waktu terluang uh, dia akan pergi membetulkan televisyen daripada jiran-jiran dan kawan-kawan yang menghantarnya lah televisyen ke ataupun radio dan sebagainya apa yang saya ikut saya ikut dah naik kereta dia pergi akan pergi ke kedai dia akan dapatkan satu sikit diagram dan circuit diagram saya tak tahu apa benda circuit diagram, masih kecil kan Circuit diagram tu dia akan gunakan, dia boleh repair TV uh, Jadi saya tengok apakah rahsianya, saya tengok ada satu buku, set buku Mana radio, elektronik, masa kecil sebelum tu memang tak faham langsung lah uh, Jadi daripada, daripada situ pun saya mendapat minat Bagaimana uh, minat dalam bidang digital ini Ataupun elektronik ini pun sendirilah Dan kalau nak katakan kartun tu, kartun yang paling saya minat ialah Jackson The Jackson ni kalau kita kata tahun 60-an, IR 4.0 memang telah diperkenalkan dalam watak kartun itu sendiri. Kita tengok robot yang tak pernah kita reka bentuk, memang dah ada 60-an dah ada robot. Kalau kita tengok kereta terbang, memang tahun tu memang dah ada kereta terbang. Kita nak tengok video conferencing, kita nak tengok smart wearable, dalam kartun tu lah yang akan menunjukkan uh, teknologi-teknologi terkini, padahal ketika itu, teknologi itu belum lagi diguna pakai lagi ataupun belum diwujudkan. Internet pun masa tu pun tak ada lagi. Dan tapi waktu itu mereka telah dapat memikirkan sesuatu yang visi yang agak jauh masa ke depan. Jadi itu yang minat saya datang. Jadi uh, alhamdulillah saya masih lagi berkecimpung dalam bidang ini walaupun tidak dapat mereka bentuk robot tapi bolehlah membantu serba sedikit dalam IoT itu sendirilah. Ah uh, itulah minat saya. Terima kasih. Thank you Dr. Maslan. Uh, favorite provides services such as favorite platform. It's a development uh, platform for IoT developers. If you're interested, please contact Dr. Maslan. They have FavorSense, which is a crowd sensing platform, Rakib, Discover, among others. I think Dr. Maslan uh, in the discussion will highlight a bit about all of these. Uh, on that note, let us move on to Dr. Rizal and ask about his background and his current ventures. Dr. Rizal. Audio, audio. Unmute. Dr. Rizal, you're on mute. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, just occurred to me that um, 
uh, the two giants, Prof Reza and Dr Mazlan, uh, are also uh, ex Mimos, uh, <laughs> and I was also with Mimos once upon a time. <laughs> um, and uh, and similarly, you know, a television show is what drive me to uh, to technology, uh, just like Prof Reza. Uh, of course, my TV series is a little bit more modern. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my interest was then, uh, I don't know MacGyver, but I'm sure a lot of people mm. today wouldn't even know what MacGyver is. Um, uh, they, so, so it starts from there. Uh, and then I continued school, uh, particularly in electrical engineering in John Hopkins. Uh, but I always like to tinker stuff. So, you know, um, you know, I always get scolded for dismantling things, never, never creating things, but dismantling. So dismantling the TV, dismantling the radio. Uh, but the interest is there. And until today, fortunately, I'm in a research institution where they let me uh, dismantle things <laughs> uh, and explore. Right. So, um, so IoT is a big part of it. Um, so we played around with many. IoT tools, uh, partly also using Dr. Um, Mazlan uh, platform uh, to 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 handle the IoT devices. Right? So that's a little bit about me, uh, Dr. Rizal. On that dismantling uh, note, uh, how do you think that it has played an important role uh, in where you are? Because oh. a lot of researchers will will have the same mindset. Yeah. So I would say, uh, you know, uh, from, from starts from six years old, as far as, far as I remember, uh, I start dismantling a lot of things. And um, uh, from there on, we discovered um, the motor in a, you know, your radio control car and how the motor moves. Um, and, you know, you start to be creative trying to, to make your own radio control cars. Of course, we didn't have the theory. I didn't have the theory enough. Um, so, you know, there's no circuits and everything. But I think it's important for um, anybody to just, you know, let your kids dismantle stuff. Uh, I think it's the first form of learning. Right, right. Uh, just one more question before we proceed to Dr. Rizal. Uh, as you said, all three of you are from uh, MIMOS. So how has MIMOS played into this journey? of where you all stand. Perhaps Dr. Rizal, a little bit about yourself on that. So, sorry, me? Uh, yes, yes. How has MIMO shaped uh, your journey? Okay, so in, in MIMOS, we, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of research culture where they started off there. Um, again, we are encouraged to explore. So my work there was mo mostly on software and open source systems. So I did have fun uh, exploring on that side uh, of, of technology. Right? Um, I, I would say there's some parts of freedom that you get in, in being a researcher there. Right? Thank you very much, Dr. Rizal. Uh, Digital Twin is basically reinventing the industrial landscape with increased efficiency and least downstream effects. Um, let's watch a quick video before we dive into the discussion with our panelists. The next big thing in industrial services, digital twins are being used to optimize the manufacturing processes. Digital twins simply means creating a virtual replica of the physical product. For example, a car, a bridge, airplanes, etc. Digital twins integrate artificial intelligence, machine learning, and software analytics with data to create living digital simulation models that update and change as their physical counterparts change. Digital twins are used to optimize machines with the maintenance of power generation equipment, such as power generation turbines, jet engines, and locomotives. Digital twins will increasingly be used in many areas, such as building management, smart buildings, healthcare, oil and gas, smart cities, and far more. Engineers can get information from the real world 
and can include the information they gather for further development. The Digital Twin gives easy access to advanced product asset maintenance and management due to its real-time nature. Decision-making is easier in highly complex cases. For example, Digital Twins helps in optimizing processes, reduce physical effort, and helps control all aspects virtually. With the help of this technology, consumer insights and behavior data gathered can help improve product development and innovation in a more data and customer-driven way. As David Surley suggests, over time, digital representations of virtually every aspect of our world will be connected dynamically with their real-world counterpart and with one another and infused with AI-based capabilities to enable advanced simulation, operation, and analysis. Wow, that's a lot of productivity, real-time sensing, analytics, and uh, improvement. I like to ask uh, Prof. Riza, Prof. Riza, uh, welcome again, and my pleasure to ask you, what is your opinion about digital twins? Okay, thank you, Dr. Sharia. Uh, we start off by comparing uh, biological twins. So to make it easier to understand biological twins, um, if we have, uh, let's say, two of these or three triplets and so on, but of course in our case it will be twins, uh, you must have, in this case, a real physical object and its equivalent digital you know, mirror. So that's why we call it digital twins. So if you don't have a physical uh, object to relate it to its corresponding digital uh, twin, then you know, we have the difficulty of trying to understand why is it called the digital twin. So uh, as we've seen in the video, the, uh, a lot of things that we can do with digital twins, but then of course also apart from opportunities, we do have uh, challenges. Uh, Prof, can you um, highlight on that uh, challenges part so that we can look into the difficult side first? Oh, you want to study on a negative note. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, you need some form of uh, knowledge. You need some form of experience. And if we look uh, briefly into the video just now, many of the things in order to realize digital twins are leveraging using mature technologies. So it's not surprising because if you're talking about modeling, simulation, augmented, augmented reality, you know, all these things are, are there. Of course, they will be improved over time. But then again, we are taking bits and pieces of these different knowledge, know-how, technologies, put it into a package, and we are calling it digital uh, twins. So the challenge then is you need the person to have the know-how. So if you are talking about modeling, you need somebody who knows what are the components of the object that you want to model, and how close is the model to the real physical object. So I'll stop there for the moment. I think so. So I think if I get it correctly, you're talking about uh, domain knowledge expertise will be very, very important in this right. case. Precisely. This. Exactly. So, so I think we will come back to, to that point later on in the panel discussion where we'll be talking about how far is Malaysia in terms of achieving this digital twin. Thank you, Prof, for your explanation. You're welcome. Uh, kita nak tujukan soalan yang sama lah kepada Dr. Mazlan. Apakah pandangan Dr. Mazlan tentang digital twin? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there are terms which sometimes we only realize today, like digital twin, you know, uh, quite recently. But in fact, just like uh, just like IoT, digital twin is also focused some time ago, many, many years. I think like IoT itself, uh, I tell you that IoT is not something that we have coin up the term in the last five years. It's since 1999 by Kevin Ashton. And the same goes with uh, Digital Twin itself. It's actually since 2002 by Michael Griffiths. But why at that time we are not very familiar with that technology, like what uh, Prof. Reza had mentioned, is because there are, there are certain new technologies that come in place which make this possible. Uh, unlike at 
initially when you know like computing power in term of internet connectivity in term of sensor technologies miniaturization of electronics and all that it was not possible at that time so only now that we are we are now seeing this going to be materialized so when i look at the video just now it's all about data right we have seen a lot of data that goes in and out and i remember the days of how we do research in fact eh? when we do research they are actually you are doing r and d there are three methods normally that people will use and validate their research is one is through analytical which is math mathematical model people like professor was very <laughs> familiar with mathematics he must love mathematical modeling people like me i don't like <laughs> mathematics so i might use a different approach so the second approach of doing r and d and validating your result is through simulation you're going to model in computer systems with your basic assumptions how the traffic going to be like how the certain parameters input that you want to assume how it's going to behave in a digital world so based on simulation and the third one is using experimental which is very expensive way of doing things right so normally you need to set up a real infrastructure you need to purchase a lot of infrastructure uh, hardware sometimes software just to make a setup a small scale setup but it's very difficult for you to scale up when using experimental work simulation you can do but once it goes into very detailed simulation it's also very difficult for you to simulate things so what happened now is that digital twin actually combined the world of this physical doing experimental work and simulation together that's why you have that both uh, the physical part the real and the simulation which is on the digital world they are digital twin so what you need is the most important part when you look at the video is the need to able to capture the real world situation and you need to simulate this this model and of course you can able to predict the future uh, that's what digital twin is all about because with that you can do a lot of wonders right instead of you know assuming instead of building the whole infrastructure from day one until the end and then you found out the result is not good you might as well able to simulate it but having a real data input is much better so that's why it tries to capture using sensor data so iot and all that uh, we'll explain later how you want to capture that and based on that real data you can turn into digital and having that twin part like uh, professor mentioned lah, either a digital twin or triplet or whatever you can have that <laughs> if you want to all right okay Pass -pass. i think it, it, it's it's best of both the worlds you have the experimental side and the simulator side and on top of that there is prediction and a lot of technologies as dr maslan said are readily available which would not have been uh, let's say you know a decade ago so so the landscape is changing uh, very fast right um, on that note uh, let us ask dr rizal uh, in context of what prof rizal and dr mazlan have discussed uh, where does dr rizal see uh, the research and development or the digital twins uh, research and development okay thank you uh, dr sharwani right um, so you know uh, like they said you know, uh, a decade ago, this technology was not there. Uh, you know, we had internet, but, you know, it wasn't as good as today. Today we have 5G, and this is an important part of uh, uh, having IR 4.0 and even digital twin. Uh, we have embedded devices that are um, low power, much smaller today. Uh, we have AI um, platforms that are being developed by popular companies like Google, Amazon, IBM. Uh, we have cloud infrastructure. We have security in the cloud infrastructure. We have blockchain that is coming and maturing, right? So all of this actually introduce and, and makes it possible for a digital twin. Right? Um, now, having all of this, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting because before, you know, all of this was just a, a idea, right? And we don't really know how we want to apply it. And having all these technologies available to us uh, allows us to, to create new solutions, right? So I'm looking into a research area uh, where 
where we can apply digital twin that can extend the human capabilities, right? So, you know, uh, so that a human being can have foresight uh, such that, you know, uh, in situations where we can predict uh, when is uh, when is a flood going to happen, or for example, what's going to be the crop yield in uh, this month, right? Uh, all with digital twin technology, right? Having foresight like this uh, makes us become shamans, uh, bomo, right? Uh, capable of making predictions before it's it happens. Right? Um, also, we are looking into, you know, augmenting our visual side, right? Uh, capable of becoming Superman. You know, we can we can see the insights of a person uh, by having a person digital twin, an engine, right? So all of this actually, the whole idea is making us super superhuman, right? <laughs> superheroes. Uh, because the digital twin has, you know, will extend our ability to, to view things. And these are all sound science fiction, but, you know, it is a fun area to do research. Uh, and it's a fun area to, to figure out whether we can shape, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether we can make science fiction into a reality. Okay, terima kasih, Atriza. Nampaknya, uh kesediaan teknologi itu sendiri memainkan peranan ya, untuk uh, nak tengok kita dah bersedia ke belum untuk uh, dive into digital twin ni ya. untuk meneruskan sesi kita mari kita tonton satu lagi video berkaitan dengan uh, digital twin um, sebelum kita meneruskan dengan perbincangan yang seterusnya Innovation is a journey without an end work that's never done We're constantly pushing the possibilities of our physical and digital worlds worlds that are increasingly converging. Driven forward by technology, from cloud to the edge, AI and IoT. Now allowing us to create digital models of our physical spaces, called digital twins. Creating the stories, touch points and solutions by realizing the relationships and interactions between people, places and devices. And with the promise of AI, we can uncover insights that see problems before we experience them. We can better understand needs and improve experiences. We can see, learn, and even predict how people move through and interact with the spaces around them. Connecting these stories and data to power modern business, building new possibilities in real time. Made possible by our partners and an end-to-end -end three cloud capability. Azure, Office, Dynamics. Help bring to life smarter spaces that connect to a digital world and turn new possibilities into new realities. Okay, berdasarkan video yang kita tonton tadi, kita dapat lihat beberapa komponen penting dalam digital twin. Antaranya artificial intelligence, AI, uh, Internet of Things, IoT dan juga uh, ada keselamatan cyber di situ. Mungkin Dr. Mazlan boleh berkongsi dengan kami bagaimana peranan IoT dalam digital twin. Okay, terima kasih. Kalau kita lihat uh, secara asasnya uh, IoT itu sendiri mempunyai empat komponen yang penting untuk kita melaksanakan sesuatu uh, IoT punya implementation. Mm -hmm. eh, kalau kita tengok yang pertama itu adalah sensors tu sendiri. Jadi kalau kita lihat sensors ni manusia mempunyai lima deria ya, eh, lima sensors tapi dalam bentuk digital. Sebenarnya kita boleh tukarkan dalam bentuk yang lebih banyak daripada lima. Eh, temperature, humidity, local uh, accelerator, you know, proximity, ambient temperature, gas sensor. Manusia pun tak boleh even detect apakah gas yang ada dalam bilik kita yang kita tahu hanya oksigen saja tapi mungkin oksigen berapa peratus oksigen pun kita tidak tahu tapi dalam bentuk digital kita boleh dapat lebih uh, accurate lagi dalam uh, untuk apa tu measurement eh. so sensor adalah komponen yang pertama itu adalah amat penting yang kedua adalah bagaimana kita hendak menghantarkan maklumat tu data daripada sensor ke tempat lain jadi kita memerlukan connectivity dalam keadaan 
tertentu konektiviti ni tidak akan sama ha, kalau kita berada di luar bandar dalam bandar dalam rumah dalam bangunan bawah bangunan dan sebagainya konektivitinya akan uh, bergantung kepada keupayaan dan suasana tersebut mungkin kita boleh gunakan seperti Bluetooth, Zigbee, RFID, kita boleh gunakan Wi-Fi, kita boleh gunakan teknologi seperti 3G, 4G dan sekarang 5G. Even now kita ada teknologi macam Neuroband IoT, Sigfox, LoRa, itu teknologi-teknologi IoT yang baru. Disebabkan kita memerlukan device-device kita adalah low power, jadi kita kena hantar lebih jauh dan teknologi macam NB IoT Lora dan sebagainya dia lebih mampu untuk guna pakai ketika itu. Jadi bila kita dah menghantar data tu kita ada kena satu tempat, ada satu platform untuk menggabungkan semua data integration. So kita ada middleware, IoT platform. Sebagaimana Fabric yang bangunkan, kita ada platform ini untuk memudahkan data-data itu untuk di 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 aggregate kan. We aggregate into one source, one platform. Jadi bila data tu dah sampai di situ, apa kita guna untuk data tu? Jadi Komponen yang keempat ialah aplikasi itu sendiri ataupun analytics. Kemungkinan kita akan menggunakan machine learning ke uh, you know, artificial intelligence, Inter- analytics engine untuk menganalisakan data, derivekan data tu inside. Jadi kalau empat komponen ni, kita, kalau kita sambungkan kepada sesuatu aset, eh, sesuatu produk. Kalau kita lihat tadi dalam bentuk video tadi yang kita tengok video tu, kalau kita ada satu produk atau aset yang kita nak monitor aset tu dibangunkan oleh satu sebuah syarikat katakan eh kita satu syarikat dia bangun satu aset dia monitor aset ni dia boleh guna dia boleh tahu siapa yang memakainya jadi sensor apa yang kita letak mungkin kita letak macam uh, RFID nya sensor kan ataupun apa dia guna what who mana kita nak tanya what 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 features yang dia pakai di mana yang dia selalu pegang di mana yang dia guna pakai dan kita nak tahu juga kedudukan aset tu where exactly the asset going to be Ha, dia akan dipakai diguna pakai di mana? Ha, yang keempat dia mungkin kita nak tahu when bila dia pakai. Adakah waktu siang, waktu malam dan waktu siang sekian sekian? Kita nak tahu juga. Dan kita nak tahu how macam mana uh, aset ni uh, kata orang tu how dia dia being used in the normal environment. Jadi dalam penggunaan aset ni kita akan tahu aset ni digunakan untuk apa? Untuk mengoptimalkan proses dia ke untuk uh, gunakan uh, mengurangkan tenaga manusia untuk digunakannya. Jadi kalau kita sambungkan data-data ni uh, sensor ke, ke bentuk uh, ke aset ini, produk ini dan kita akan translate dia ke dalam bentuk digital dan kita akan lihat dalam bentuk digital tu kita dah dapat data, kita akan lihat secara real time data itu digunakan di mana. Sebagai contoh kalau aset tu kenderaan, kita tahu kenderaan tu pergerakannya di mana, kelajuan dia di mana dan dia waktu bila yang dia dipakai yang paling peak hours dan sebagainya jadi kita tahu tentang penggunaan aset tu rather dan kita duduk dan lihat aset tu dengan mata kasar kita sendiri kita hanya menarik data tu ke satu tempat dan kita boleh guna pakai data tu untuk derive the insights of the, the information jadi dengan empat komponen ini itu itu yang menyebabkan IoT dalam digital twin itu begitu kata orang tu uh, pentinglah komponennya sebab tanpa IoT ni data tidak akan dapat di di di, di aggregate kan dan dianalisakan di uh, itulah yang dikatakan uh, uh, ke, kegunaan IoT dalam digital twin itu sendiri lah. Thank you, Doctor. You have a question, Doctor Rizal. Please go ahead. No, no, it's alright. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Mazlan, for that insightful uh, explanation on uh, DT, IoT, uh, AI. We'll come back to you. Um, in, in terms of Dr. Mazlan, who has been a proponent of industrial IoT, uh, IIoT, any business that deals with the production or um, transportation of physical goods, uh, this IoT can be uh, really game-changing in terms of operational efficiencies. And uh, you can actually revamp your business models completely. And, and you'll be surprised to know that the applications are diverse. They range all the way from production uh, to supply chain, uh, building management, uh, even healthcare uh, to retail among others. Dr. Rizal, uh, we'll head to you. Could you tell us 
about the expanding domain of artificial intelligence and cloud computing uh, in view of the digital twins specifically and uh, generally in view of the current industrial revolution. All right. So uh, we're talking about two areas here that has been uh, significantly matured uh, the last couple of years. Uh, so if we're, if we're looking into the cloud architecture uh, or the cloud services, uh, you know, it has been around. We have a, a model uh, to, to provide pool of services you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the forms of network, server, storage, applications, the services that are available, uh, available right? Uh, but today things are getting cheaper, right? For, for in, in the beginning we have, uh, you know, on premises, those things are expensive. So, you know, if you were to try to build anything it would cost you a lot of money. And then we had virtualization where we have infrastructure as a service. And then today we have something even better. We call it com uh, container as a service, right? Uh, and then we're moving further into uh, things like what we call uh, platform as a service, right? So now uh, Amazon, for example, have taken a step further uh, where we have function as a service, right? So um, this is a bit more complex than just, you know, we call it a serverless architecture where, you know, if you want some application to run or to provide some kind of function, you no longer require a server, right? Uh, you don't need any infrastructure in that sense, right? Or uh, so all you need to know is some programming language and deploy it on a serverless architecture. Right? Now, those are those new things basically allows people to implement something really cheap. Right? Uh, so you don't need anything significant uh, spending. So you just use uh, pay as what you use. Right? Now, uh, in the AI area, uh, AI platforms today we have a lot of things going on, you know, uh, particularly the algorithms have improved uh, by, by far. So, you know, we are able to do a lot of, mach you know, machine learning uh, um, computation uh, that, that works very efficient, right? Now they have pushed this into uh, providing APIs so, you know, people like IBM, Watson, uh, Google, Node, uh, provide, provide analytics and provides AI platforms that you can pay as a service. Uh, and, and, you know, you can make your application become intelligent, right? So, you know, previously when we think about building this kind of things, it sounds almost daunting, uh, very difficult, right? But today, if you want to implement uh, you know, a, a facial recognition, uh, IoT device to open a door, right? Uh, this simply can be done uh, by just, you know, uh, for free, but right? using your free account on Google Note, right? And, uh, you know, you can, you can test your prototype on a serverless architecture and, you know, and then you have a IoT device with, you know, facial recognition, right? smart enough to recognize who's coming in and uh, to, 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 your, to open the door, right? So all of this readiness in the, in the industry, right? Uh, you know, with the cloud computing, with the AI architecture platforms that they provide, you know, brings down the barrier of entry, uh, whether we're talking about research or we're talking about application development or we're talking about, you know, coming up with a product in that ecosystem. So, you know, we have, we have uh, switches that are smart today, right? Uh, that works in the IoT environment, that can study the network environment uh, by just, uh, you know, by, by just um, using the AI platforms provided by uh, AI providers. 
Uh, you, you make it sound very easy, uh, Dr. Rizal. So I, I would like to ask you, when, when you say uh, you use the words as a service platform, as a service or serverless architecture or the services that are now online uh, from different uh, corporates like Microsoft and so on, uh, would you expand like one or two more examples of how things have become easy, uh, which would have been difficult in the past? Yeah, um, so, so for example, right? Uh, when we talk about AI as a platform on the cloud, right? Uh, in order to do computation, uh, you require a computer mm -hmm. that has a very high-end processing power uh, with several GPU cards, right, to do fast computation. Right? Uh, this machine usually costs a few thousand, right? And the barrier for entry, if you know, if you're just a you know, someone who likes to tinker or if you're a developer, you know, this would be out of your scope, right? Uh, as for financial wise, right? But today, you know, uh, these services are available for you to play around with uh, that hardly cost you anything. So you can start developing your smart solutions, right? And we will uh, continue our discussion with our next panelist, Prof. Riza. Dr. Habiza has a question to ask. Terima kasih, Dr. Syariah. Saya ingin bertanyakan dalam konteks yang sama lah kepada Prof. Tadi kita nampak ada komponen artificial intelligence, cloud, IoT. Bagaimana pula peranan keselamatan cyber dalam digital twin? Okay. Kalau kita lihat seperti Dr. Mazlan sebut tadi, yang menjadi dia punya core di sini iaitu trust kepada kejayaan digital twin ni itu adalah data dia. Data. So kalau kita lihat data tu uh, pertamanya seperti awal tadi saya sebutkan kita perlu adakan satu model untuk menjadi digital twin kepada objek yang kita cuba jadikan sebagai seiras itu. Kemudian, bila kita dah adakan this digital twin ni ataupun model, perlu adakan data yang boleh dihantar daripada objek fizikal tu kepada model yang kita bina. So data ni, bila dia datang, dia hendaklah sesuatu yang uh, berterusan. Tidaklah semestinya setiap saat, tapi dia kena berterusan supaya kita boleh masuk ke dalam model itu dan update. So, komponen ketiganya nak updating. Kalau model kita itu statik, dia tak boleh tak menjadi sesuatu. sesuatu. So, kita so, kena, kita kena ambil, ambil data yang dimasukkan kepada model itu dan kemudian model itu akan bertindak balas supaya dia akan dapat seolah-olah uh, memberitahu kita objek fizikal itu akan bertukar seperti yang sedemikian. Mengikut masa yang kita sedang Uh, perhatikan. Jadi uh, saya nak bagi penekanan di sini bahawa lazimnya digital twin ni digunakan untuk dipanggil uh, high value ataupun yeah. high end application dan juga untuk safety critical application. Maksudnya kalau kita ambil autonomous vehicle kereta yang tanpa pemandu Autonomous vehicle ni, kalau kita bayangkan kalau kita duduk dalam uh, taksi yang autonomous vehicle ni berjalan dan kita uh, sangat percaya kepada uh, kenderaan ini. So, data yang kita suapkan ataupun has been fed into the model ensure the, the autonomous vehicle itu sebenarnya is the real object physical sedangkan sistem yang memberi tahu atau berkomunikasi dengan dashboard dalam uh, autonomous vehicle tu ialah digital twin dia. So data sedang berinteraksi dengan apa yang berlaku di persekitaran kenderaan dan apakah kenderaan itu nak lakukan. Kalau data tu dimanipulasi oleh seorang hacker sudah so tentu dia hanya akan membahayakan Uh, mereka yang duduk dalam kereta tu lah. So ini satu benda yang saya rasa mudah nak diberitahu bahawa data, the data must be trusted, the model must be, must be trusted 
as well as updating of the model must be trusted. So, kalau kita tak ada perkataan trust tu, which is the core of uh, information security ataupun cyber security, then uh, digital twin is not really helpful. So, sebenarnya cyber security is very much at the heart of digital twin. Kita tak ada uh, mengambil kira keselamatan maklumat dalam digital twin ni ke perkataan yang kita sebut tadi trust tu tak dapat diwujudkan dan dalam aplikasi-aplikasi yang sangat penting seperti autonomous vehicle tadi tu ia boleh membahayakan dan meragut nyawa. Okay, terima kasih Prof. Jadi uh, security requirement kita balik pada security requirement saya kita perlu ada confidentiality, integrity dan paling penting sekali availability of the data lah kan Prof. Kan? Betul, betul. So, uh, yeah. It looks like uh, cyber security is the bloodline, uh, you know, from the heart of uh, digital twin. Prof, uh, it is not possible to implement such an architecture unless uh, you can promise uh, the security uh, with, with of the entire architecture. The prof, from experience. Yes. Yeah, it's true indeed that, uh, as I said. The digital twin is most useful, especially in high-end or high-value application, mm. as well as safety-critical application. And in these circumstances, we cannot afford to compromise the cybersecurity of the applications. And hence, we have to put all our efforts to ensure, the, uh, as uh, Dr. Fiza mentioned just now, data in use, data address, data, uh, you know, uh, in... Uh, in motion, yeah. So which means we need to look to, to look into the confidentiality, integrity, availability of data. Okay, uh, now now that we have uh, discussed uh, the the technical background, uh, what DT is, and the other aspects, I think a challenging question, especially in terms of uh, the pandemic that we are facing. And the IR 4.0 is was also in motion in the country. So, what do you think? What are your thoughts about the technical career pattern uh, in the era of uh, current industrial revolution? Given that we are still trying to survive the pandemic. Uh, yeah, I was recently looking into uh, job street, not because I want to look for new jobs, but I'm trying to help my daughter to find a job. And when I type in, for example, physics, uh, immediately things coming out from the search, data uh, scientists, data analysts, you know, the, the trend now, what is trending is people are talking about somebody who can, you know, crunch the data, make sense of the data. So it's a matter of time when Malaysia will be looking towards the next phase, which is data, you know, data twin. Uh, twin, you know, kind of uh, experts. So uh, these are the things that we have to look into uh, right in the near future. So if we are looking into uh, COVID-19 issues, one of the things that um, digital twin may be useful is uh, to look into the how this uh, virus is able to evolve and mutate. And then we may have a model to, uh, you know, to, to follow through what are the things that are giving it the, 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 the food, for example, the, the environment that is very conducive for this uh, virus to spread. And in the end, we'll be able also to, you know, complement that new knowledge with vaccines, uh, you know, new, new knowledge on how to, to handle this kind of pandemic. So, so on that note, when you mentioned about the job street and uh, being a, a vice chancellor at at a university, uh, considering the students and your daughter in particular, uh, a lot of people are, are are jumping into the area of uh, big data, big data analytics. There's a lot of jobs coming in. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, we need to jump in at such a pace? Uh, I mean, because eventually the market is going to get saturated, right? And then. Uh, this the job market is again, uh, you know, people are going to struggle again. So, what are your advices uh, on that on that end? 
my advice to all of us, including my daughter, of course, <laughs> is to be multidisciplined. That means you don't need to be, you know, focusing on just one specialization uh, and uh, ignoring others. So a, a simple definition of creativity is to make the connection between two things that may have not been connected before. So from, from history, we've seen quite clearly scholars, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, they have been very much multidisciplined. So, you know, if you have uh, some exposure to uh, social sciences and you also have some exposure to uh, the STEM or SNT, science and technology background. Nowadays, I think some of you, adik-adik di luar sana, mungkin Google umpamanya citizen science. Citizen science adalah satu bidang. It is a, a, a discipline where you do not need to be an expert in science, but you are sharing your expertise and your know-how with others from various disciplines to promote SNT. Uh, I will ask one more question before we head out uh, asking Dr. Maslan. Uh, uh, Prof. Reza, uh, being a multidisciplinary yourself in an age which was, uh, I would say, comparatively more difficult than uh, we have a lot of ease today, uh, you know, in your own time, how did you manage to you know, uh, bring together all those disciplines and try to carve a niche for yourself? Yeah, thank you for that very important question. Uh, I started off by referring to science fiction, uh, movies, you know, dramas. Uh, yeah, you carry on with this kind of hobby. You'll be able to, you know, complement whatever you get from reading books and also uh, interacting with uh, different people. So from there, you'll be able to find out um, what are the things that are, you know, the pain points in society today, and what are the solutions to elevate these pain points. So uh, on one hand, we started off just now with uh, uh, an overview of about digital twin at 30,000 feet. But uh, on the other hand, we need to bring that 30,000 feet down to around three feet nearer to the ground. So that is where it means most to, you know, people are asking to, to be able to withdraw their money from EPF, KWSP. These are real issues. And we are here to solve problems, not to just give ideas and no follow-ups. Thank you, Prof. Uh, pandangan yang menarik sekali. Ya. Imaginasi itu penting, ya, Prof. Eh? Uh, yes. Imaginasi kita relatekan dengan uh, Real world problem lah kan? Correct. Hmm, terima kasih Pak. Okay, uh, Dr. Mazlan sebagai uh, pemain dalam industri lah, mungkin doktor boleh uh, terangkan sedikit uh, bagaimana corak kejayaan teknikal dalam era IR 4.0 ni. Hmm, okay. Agak kompleks. <laughs> Dia lebih kurang macam inilah. Apa yang kita lihat, uh, kita kena menyediakan tenaga kerja kita dengan skill-skill yang berbeza bergantung kepada uh, industri atau bidang mana yang mereka nak ceburi. Sebab sekarang ni pun kita tengok the, the technology have been converged. Uh, the technology convergence. So it's no longer like you are specialized in one certain uh, apa kata orang tu, uh, technology but you want to neglect others. Uh, even like myself, I've been working on various technologies just to understand because this technology uh, depend on each other. Eh? Uh, for a start, if, if we want to do, in Malaysia for example, in, in any new technologies, uh, emergence of new technologies and the adoption of new technologies, there are few people, uh, there, are, there are a lot of talents that we require to support, uh, to ensure that this technology or this uh, new way of thinking going to be very successful in any countries. Because there are four things that we need to do and we need these four kind of people. One. We understand that if you launch something, we need to do some trial first, kan? Normally, when we do trial, the trial needs to do because we need to understand the technology maturity. So, understanding the technology maturity will enable you to see whether the, the, the technology is safe enough, mature enough uh, to be deployed in the real commercial world. Yeah? Secondly, when you want to do trial, you also want to understand the market adoption. 
Market adoption means that technologies like driverless car, you know, driverless taxi. Who wants to take a taxi where, where there is no driver at all? Uh, do you think women will take it? So we need to understand the market adoption, the user experience. Uh, do you need, can you, are you willing to take a flying taxi? So that's why you need this kind of trial to understand how the market will adopt. Eh? Thirdly, because the complexity of these new things, that we are disrupting a business. So we must find and think about the new business models. Are we going to charge the normal way of charging? Hey, you buy my system, that's it. Uh, I just tend to forget about that. Or you want to subscribe to my services. Or nowadays, they call it outcome-based business model. Meaning to say, if you reach to an outcome, you will pay for that service. If you don't meet the outcome, you don't pay for the service. I want to arrive in KL within 30 minutes. I will take the flying taxi because it guaranteed you in, within 30 minutes you will arrive there. Otherwise, you don't pay me that amount. Okay? And the fourth part is that you need to understand the policy and regulatory needs to be changed. So policy and regulatory plays a very big important role because if you work in that area, if you too much, if you are trying to start, you know, you can, if you control the policy and regulatory, it can be stifle the innovation. But you also want to ensure that the citizens are safe in using the, the technology. Yeah? The business are safe, the, the people are safe. But don't tighten it so much that you don't know whether you can deploy this industry technology. For example, like Gojek, for example, Gojek in Indonesia, people can go for ride, ride hailing, right? Uh, motorcycle ride sharing. Malaysia at one time, they go not being approved because they don't know. The regulatory cannot say that you can carry another passenger behind you. So it's regulatory has to change. So in a driverless car, do you think that driverless car has been, that is a regulation stating that this, this car doesn't have any driver or no steering? The term of a car have a steering and four, you know, four wheels, for example. So the new definition have to change. So what I'm saying is that the people, the new talents that we want have to understand these four, uh, four cases, four, four scenarios. If you want to work in the regulatory body, you also got to understand that this new talent that you want to you know, uh, encourage innovation, but protect the citizens. And when you build your technology, you have to ensure that it's really mature technology and make it safe for people. If you're in the business part, you got to understand technology will not sell unless people are going to use it. So these are the new talents have to have that kind of thinking. All right. So other than that, that's for more the external part. The internal part is more about the change management, the way that people think about this digitalization. Will, is, it, is it going to change? How is it going to change? Are you going to face a new generation, which, you know, an a older generation, which is not adapt to new technology you, you, against the, the Gen X and the Gen Y, uh, Gen Y and the Gen Z is very tech savvy. You want to see that the processes that you have been used before, maybe one very long process with digital is going to be reduced. No more red tips. You don't have power anymore for people who want to sign that your, your, your signatory. So you might lose some power. And then the culture may have changed. You know, the culture of inside an organization, maybe it's flat uh, uh, structure because easier for you to communicate. You need to understand that uh, you cannot no longer work in silos. You need to break down all the, the, the barriers. So you break down, you must have champion in certain projects. So, and of course you need to build new talents. Technology comes and go, at, you know, like, like cycle, you know, technology life cycle, they go at one time, it's very peak after that it goes down, a new technology comes in. So you need to quickly uh, give the, 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 the staff new, new, new knowledge for them to build quickly in order for them to adapt with this new technology. Otherwise, if three to seven years, if the organization is not going to change, it's going to become obsolete. Your product is going to be obsolete. Your organization also cannot compete. So in this case, what, what we're saying is that uh, the new talents of uh, the IR 4.0 must be very agile also and understand the trends, what's coming. Because it's no longer like, you know, like 100 years, a technology come and go. No, it can be like five years, 10 years, the technology life cycle just exists today. So even the universities, they need to change again and again. Very, you know, by the time you, you, you refresh your content, a new technology comes in and you have to introduce new technology. So you're trying to keep up with all this pace. 
All right? So, uh, we have to do that. So, not only the technology is going to be uh, fast changing, the way the process of approving, you know, uh, new contents inside the university also needs to change too. So, to quickly change, to adapt to the, the industry needs. Okay. Ya, terima kasih Dr. Mazlan. Menarik sekali. Eh? Walaupun kita dalam era IR 4.0 ni nampak macam semua uh, dikontrol oleh uh, sensors, nampak uh, sangat uh, automatik. Tapi ada peranan insan tu di situ. Okay, uh, jadi untuk teruskan, kita ada sediakan satu lagi klip video tentang uh, digital twin. Uh, jadi kita sama-sama tonton. For example, the digital twin of an electric motor not only showcases form, but also analyzes functions. From the rotation of the shaft, to thermal conductivity, to data from sensors and beyond. What's more, the digital twin continuously evolves. Thanks to the flow of data, user experience feedback and new input. And it's greatly impacting development, production and operation. In development, a product's behavior can be simulated and tested long before a physical prototype has been built. Siemens utilized the digital twin to develop a world record setting electric aircraft motor that not only weighs 50 kilograms, but is also five times more powerful than comparable electric motors. But it doesn't stop there. Digital twins also unleash the power of 3D printing. In a recent Siemens study for gas mixing systems, insights from the simulation of form and flow behavior were combined with generative algorithms. The result? A truly unique channel shape and configuration, one significantly more efficient than anything previously designed. Even entire factories down to individual machines can be simulated and tested. For instance, robots. It's difficult for them to perform milling tasks because large forces in the manufacturing process lead to inaccurate movements. But with the digital twin, the forces that push the robot away from the milling path can be calculated and compensated in real time, keeping the robot in its path. When it comes to operations, digital twins can compare the sensor data of a real point in real time with the simulation of its point. The availability of the point parallel to operations can be reliably predicted and sudden disruptions become a thing of the past. But this is just the beginning, and Siemens is already driving the future. Merging digital twins with artificial intelligence allows computers to independently design advanced products. Siemens is realizing this potential right now with Californian startup Hackrod, which aims to build customized sports cars. For development, production, and operation, the digital twin breaks with traditional paradigms and opens up extraordinary possibilities. That's why digital twins are the innovation backbone of the future. Innovation backbone of the, of the future. Uh, and, I, and I would like to take this opportunity to, to ask Dr. Mazlan to what, about what he was discussing um, I'm quite interested uh, when we touch the subject of uh, regulation and regulatory bodies. Uh, Dr. Maslan, uh, you've been in the industry for quite a long time. You have been a proponent of uh, industrial IoT and you actually have uh, many ongoing projects under your belt. So you have a um, hands-on uh, free experience. Uh, so on that note, what do you think? How practical is digital twin for Malaysia? Um, do you see applications of DT here? Um, a few questions actually. Uh, are there any big players or emerging ones that we should be looking forward to? Okay. Uh, in any new technologies, it has to go through a certain phases of adoption. Uh, when we started off with IoT, it was not an easy journey for many organizations because one of the things is that people are not aware about IoT itself, for example. Eh? Uh, just to be fair to say that, you know, when exactly that you really Google the word IoT to really understand IoT. So when we look at Google Trend, you, there's a tool called Google Trend. You say Malaysia, you choose IoT. Malaysians start to Google IoT since 2014. Huh, remember that. When the, the term IoT have been coined by Kevin Asher in 1999. 
Singapore. It was many, many years ago. So now you're talking about digital twins. I, I haven't got the time to, digi- to, to Google it. So if you try Google Trends, digital twin in Malaysia, when do Malaysians start to Google digital twins? To be fair. So if it says that only last two years, so it's still a very new journey, even though it has been coined by Michael Griffiths in 2002. Right. So it has to go to that process. One is the process of understanding it. Uh, no, sorry. One is the process of research and development. The moment it's stable enough, it goes to commercial. The moment it wants to go to commercial, it takes some time because we need to educate the industry, education of industry. So IoT have gone to that phase of educating the industry. So now it's the same phase with what we talk about AI, for example, blockchain, for example. They are now undergoing what we call education phase. So if digital twin is just only recently for one or two years back, so it's going to take a little bit more time for them to educate the industry. The industry is, there are, there are two things. One is the technology providers and the one is actually the one that consume. So the techno- technology providers, people like us outside here are so eager. They want to implement. But the question is, are you ready inside an organization? Are you ready to adopt and embrace digital twin? So uh, you have a solution, but you need also the, 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 the consumer to, to the, the, the demand side to use it. Uh, so this is also the challenge. So you need to build that demand, make sure that they understand the real need for digital twin. So what we are seeing in Malaysia, a lot of organizations are still in the technology, the provider themselves, the one that supply. The demand side is still a bit of challenging. They need to understand uh, the, the usefulness of digital twins. So we need, by hook or by crook, we still need to have, uh, what do you call that? We need to educate the people out there. We have seen organizations, the one that, you know, vendors who are very good in this digital twins is like the video that we have seen, Siemens, General Electric, Cisco, Desktop Systems, Microsoft, Oracle, PTC, NCS, IBM, Bosch. These are the IR 4.0 organizations, right? So you, you know that. So because they are good in 3D printing, they are good in IOT, industrial IoT, they're good in digital transformation. So we had to go to that process first. But who are the ones that adopt it? Uh, something which we need to ask for the next panel to answer, lah, if they can answer this. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll pass back to you, doctor. I, 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 think, I think at this part of time, uh, do you think that, uh, so one thing you, you highlighted was education, and we're going to come back to that. The other thing I want to ask you is that, is affordability an issue of DT in Malaysia at the moment? Yes, uh, there are a few factors which impact normally this kind of new adoption of this. One is the, 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 the most difficult part is the mindset transformation. They need really to understand that this is really a need required because if they don't transform, they might face uh, you know issue of competitiveness. But in the case of Digital Twin, mainly this meant for the SME or sorry, or the, the people who produce things. They want to produce products, which they can predict how the products going to be look like. You know, so these are the users themselves, uh, not using the traditional way of uh, building it and two years and then after that they just launch it and then they they have a problem they come back to the the lab and rebuild it. So it's going to take a longer time. That is the era of IR 3.0, 2.0 sort of thing. This is era IR 4.0. So they need to use the technology themselves. Uh, so I think I think that that's how I think we we, we are seeing the, the challenge that we are facing now. Okay. okay, one quick question before moving on. So in terms of education or of the technology, uh, do you think that universities or in what capacities do educational institutions play the role? Because this is where your next next gen is going to come out from. What kind of role do universities play in this transformation? Uh, I mean, I, I've been uh, working very closely with them since 2014, and I've seen the changes in many universities. They have already embraced and uh, refreshed the contents uh, uh, based on the needs of the industry. But of course, there are also there are challenges. I mean, the universities need to very validate this. But from us, we are seeing that sometimes the moment we you know make changes in the courses or coursework, it takes them one year or two years to get it approved. So that process is something. It, 
it's a weakness that you know a challenge that you they need to face because technology moves very fast. They cannot wait for one or two years down the road. Uh, right. But we are seeing the, the 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 changes in the universities. And of course, they are the one that should supply the right talents. Thank you, Dr. Mazlan. Thank you, um, Prof. Uh, in view of what Dr. Mazlan has just discussed, and uh, we heard Dr. Mazlan mention some of the big giants who have already implemented digital twins, right, Prof? Uh, what opportunities do you see for our SMEs in the country? Can they capitalize on this? Oh, thank you, Dr. Sharia. Definitely. Uh, if we view the, this last video, it's also sending a message down to many of us that, you know, these people are at the forefront and they have already invested billions of dollars into this kind of uh, in, uh, initiative. So what chance do we have for developing countries like Malaysia? So the only way to move, to bring us closer to the first world, how I see it is uh, we have to look at, for example, I'll give you an example, we have uh, open source. Okay. We have open source versus uh, proprietary softwares, for example. Right, so. the, the, the mindset which uh, Dr. Mazlan is trying to highlight here also uh, and encroach into this, uh, this challenge where many of us may not want to move and adapt to you know, this kind of uh, approaches where you may get something, you know, almost free, but yet you want to pay for something which is relatively expensive. So let me drive home what I'm trying to say. Uh, the way that Malaysia can, you know, move forward, especially our SMEs, is to go into a mode we call it learn more, discover more, and share more. Right. So which means at the heart of this uh, initiative or approach is altruism, selflessness, not to be selfish. You see, for open source, you know, you can look into the, the source code and you can see whatever the thing that is revealed there. But for some of these uh, uh, proprietary softwares, you will be not uh, given access to see what are you know, the codes there. I'm giving you an example. So at the same time, you have this uh, community of practice mm. where they are sharing, you know, so that you learn more, you discover more, and you share more. So in this case, when you do this, uh, you know, you bring that level of uh, competitiveness down to a certain manageable level where you are empowering the consumer. So instead of you are always you know, at the mercy of the producer. So the mindset here is for us, for the SMEs in Malaysia in particular, to move forward, we have to work together as a team. Right, Bob. Uh, before we move on to, and we're very really excited uh, about Dr. Rizal talking about the CRS, I have two questions, uh, Prof, for you. Um, one is that given your vast academic and industrial experience in terms of research and development and teaching and you know holding administrative positions in the university, so you have interacted with a lot of people. Are the technic is the technical community in the country ready for this transformation at this point of time? That is my first question. And the second one is that Dr. Mazdan highlighted uh, that it's a painstaking process for the universities to update their their, you know, so-called curriculum, you know? So, so what is your advice on that? Okay, thank you, Dr. Sharia. The first one is we have to accept that the pandemic, COVID-19, is a disruption. Okay, we have to agree on this because we have now used the term, the new norm. Okay, and then whatever is now normal is not normal. Okay, and at the same time, which is very interesting to me here is, uh, we put it, we mold this into what we call as a cause and effect framework. So you have a disruption in the form of C19. So that is the cause. 
and then we have the effect based on the cause, which is the pandemic. So in terms of uh, practicality, we have, uh, we have now adapted to teaching and learning online. So that you say, in fact, some form of uh, way of we are trying to handle the, the cost. So the effect comes into various forms now. We have the introduced things like working from home, teaching and learning online, and many other initiatives. Okay, wearing the face masks, SOPs, something that uh, Malaysia, uh, ironically, is much better than America, United States. So uh, with that in mind, how fast we have reacted to the cost, which is the pandemic, is, I would say, uh, remarkable. You see, we, 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 I started off saying at the beginning that if we take an example of a digital twin, it is a combination of mature technologies. That's why not many of our institutions, uh, higher education, even in schools, have really that difficulty to adopt teaching and learning online. Of course, the challenges are still there, but we can easily now accept that as the new norm. You see, so the first question I'm saying, trying to say is yes, we are. We have demonstrated as a society, as a nation, that we can adapt to the cost, and we have taken drastic steps to to address so that we have the effect. And on the second mode, you see, when we talk about uh, how fast universities are adapting to this new norm, the new normal and so on. Uh, it has already been in practice many, many years that the collaboration between the industries and the universities, the academia, uh, have been ongoing. See, the, the only problem, I guess, is uh, they have yet to find a middle ground on how to reconcile somehow, but now it has uh, reached to a certain level where we cannot wait any longer. And we need to find this uh, middle ground where both sides will be able to you know, reconcile and come up to, to some kind of agreement to address things that what Dr. Mazran said that technologies are also uh, moving, evolving, disruptive. So things are now you know, changing very quickly so um, as far as infrastructure and the processes in the university academia is there, but uh, we need to work closer with all the stakeholders to address you know, things like this uh, pandemic C-19. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Maknanya kalau kita kita mampu untuk mengendalikan digital twin technology ini selagi mana kita bersedia untuk menerima perubahan ya. Uh, ya betul. Terima kasih. Okey, uh, kita ke soalan seterusnya. Uh, Dr. Rizal. Okay, dalam tajuk webinar kita pada hari ini, tajuknya Seiras Digital Twin dan IR 4.0. Ada perkataan Seiras di situ. Mungkin Dr. Rizal boleh jelaskan apakah yang dimaksudkan dengan Seiras? Ha, kalau dibenarkan saya share slide boleh? Uh, can I share my slide? Of course. Can, can. Yeah, sure. All right, can you guys see that? It's coming on the way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, you know, uh, SEIRAS stands for Secure Industrial IoT Replica with AI Systems, right? Uh, we call it SEIRAS because it just sounds very, uh, very cute like that, right? So, uh, you know, uh, because twins are cute, and you know, digital twin is very technical. So eras meaning uh, you know identical twins sounds fitting for this project. And our goal basically, if you look into the ecosystem, the whole world has a physical layer, and we want to build a digital layer. And a lot of these things are maturing, and you know we you know so eras goals 
is basically to help uh, SMEs trying to uh, participate in uh, digital twin. Now, in, in the past, you see, uh, let me jump a bit, sorry. In the past, we see big companies are dealing with this, right? Uh, most of this are big businesses. You know, we're talking about Microsoft, Azure, Bentley. You know, these are all big companies, Siemens, right? But what about our SMEs? You know, this, you know, our nation is, Malaysia is basically built by SMEs. Uh, and they make about 97% of uh, the country's manufacturing sector, right? It will be very difficult for them to enter digital twin technology without proper guidance, without proper help, without proper uh, test beds, right? And what 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 we want to be as uh, Seiras here is that, you know, to provide the expertise, uh, whether you're in agriculture, whether you're in healthcare, city, construction, manufacturing, right? Uh, so, you know, IIUM would, would be the one-stop center where we share our ideas, just like Prof. Reza is talking about, you know, uh, try to do experimentation as test beds. You know, we gain, uh, you know, local industries who like uh, Dr. Mazlan, who works with IoT, so that we integrate all of these solutions and make it affordable for SMEs in Malaysia, right? Uh, this is the only way for us to, uh, you know, if not overtake, maybe, you know, run almost in parallel with uh, other, other big companies, right? So, you know, we have a lot of local developers who are coming out with their own IoTs. And there's a lot of dimensions here that needs to be uh, um, addressed. We're talking about, you know, modeling and simulations. We have talked to several partners in these areas, uh, local developers in AI, uh, product and optimizations, and, you know, some of the enhancement for human machine beha uh, behaviors and stuff. So, a lot of these things requires a uh, multifaceted uh, approach from, you know, we're talking about training, we're talking about, uh, you know, having a, 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 a test bed in this, in this development. So, so what Seiras has started to, 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 uh, to do is that we have approaches uh, a lot of uh, several companies in several sectors when we talk about security here, we work with Cybersecurity Malaysia. Uh, we hope to work with IoT companies that provides IoT infrastructure. Uh, we've talked to certain manufacturer of devices like Joa Corporations. Uh, we've talked to AI companies like um, Human Logica, right? So these are companies that, uh, you know, local make, right? Uh, they have, uh, you know, they are working and coming up with a superb solutions. And like Prof. Reza said, if we share our expertise, our ideas, we can come up with a solution that is affordable for SMEs. And the whole idea is to make it work for Malaysia because we are built out of SMEs, right? Uh, a lot of our businesses are uh, from the SME sector, right? And uh, so IRAS would be the place where, you know, um, people would come and share ideas to get training to train their staff uh, to get, you know, uh, experiment done or, you know, validation on their product, right, and consultancy. So, you know, I welcome the public uh, to, to come with us, you know, to figure out on what, you know, uh, future uh, dimensions in, in uh, digital twin that we can work together. Um, everyone is welcome to KICT, uh, our cybersecurity center um, with the new project, uh, CRS, uh, as Dr. Rizal explained. On the thought of uh, local made and that the SMEs are the major driving forces in the country, um, I would like to ask uh, all of you uh, perhaps a final question as we head towards the end of this webinar. Um, which is that, um, what is your advice, you know, briefly um, to our youth? Because it's the youth that will be taking over, you know, how do they prepare for the emerging uh, landscape? 
Prof. Riza? Okay. Um, the thirst, the thirst for knowledge, dahaga kad ilmu. Okay, for Muslims, uh, if we look into the historian, the famous historian, Franz uh, Rosenthal, he was looking into the, the history of the success of Islam. So, according to him, ilmu, ilm in Arabic, knowledge is not just knowledge. According to this famous historian, ilm or ilmu in our Bahasa Malaysia is Islam, according to him. So it's not just about uh, theory, it's about practice, it's about education. So the thirst of uh, ilm or the kan ilmu ini, if we can instill this in the mind of the youth, of the Muslim world in particular, it will help them to face the challenges and also find the opportunities to, to bring about significant changes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maslan, what, are your, what is your advice to the youth? Um, I think similar to what Prof. Reza mentioned, it's about knowledge too. Uh, I believe that that continuous learning should be embedded with uh, to uh, oneself. Uh, as mentioned earlier also that the, the technology is very fast and keep on changing. So the, the, the youth needs to be aware about the technology trend. Uh, take a look at what's coming in the three to five years down the road. Uh, ensure that they, they are well prepared and they can be one of the earliest uh, innovators in that part. And of course, whatever technology that you want to build, ensure that it will benefit the society too. All right, thanks. Dr. Reza, please uh, add what you think being, being teaching the youth. What, what's your advice? No, uh, to me, you know, uh, the technology that's, uh, you know, what we teach in school is mostly theory. And um, the industry is moving really fast. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people actually uh, thinks that, you know, industries are not, not sharing information. Uh, but, you know, if you go into, um, if you get into technologies that are, um, that's popular now, you see that, you know, there's a forums, there are, they are talking about it. There are very helpful people in there, you know. And, you know, all of this, you know, we're talking, you know, technology is like, you know, cloud computing today uh, relies on many things. Uh, you know, one of it is Kubernetes um, and it's being implemented for IoT edge computing and a lot of other things. And I encourage, you know, people in technology, whether you're, you know, whether you're technical or you're, whether you're less technical in computer science to learn about cloud infrastructure, AI uh, implementation, because you need to know the big picture, right? Um, so even if you don't know a lot, you have to be an expert in one area, but you still need to know the other areas so that you know the big picture and you can provide better value uh, to sell yourself, right? When you join uh, the working force, right? And you can, you can see further in providing solutions and be part of a company in achieving um, solutions that are, you know, looking ahead, right? So it, I know it's uh, difficult. A lot of people want to stay in their own area, but it's not the case anymore, right? So you have to know uh, a lot of things, at the same time, um, you know, be an expert in your in a certain area yourself. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rizal. Uh, uh, we know we are running out of time, but I would request all the panelists just to take perhaps a question each, if you would allow, because our our uh, viewers have put in a couple of questions, but then you might just go through one question each. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, fine. Okay, okay. Um, so so, bro, this question is uh, <laughs> uh is for you. Um, uh, Ammar asks, does a degree in IT or CS guarantee a job uh, now that the market demands digitization in your business? 
Okay, uh, my answer is, it depends on the definition of job. As far as I'm concerned, when you get a degree, a proper formal training in universities, end up with a scroll, perhaps a transcript, then the job that we are concerned with, whether you are, some people call it entrepreneur, some call it uh, working for a company, working for the government, self-employed, furthering your, your education. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it depends on how you define the job. The way we have been trained formally means we are able to think critically, make decisions, and analyze. So to me, whatever you do, if you take it seriously, be it doing arts, social sciences, physics, you are being coached, you are being taught, and you, by the end of the day of the three or four year program, you are an established human being with a sense of purpose that you know what you have to do. So to me, yes, it guarantees you a job. So it depends on the definition of job. Okay, Prof, thank you. So, so it's more about um, the, the process itself rather than uh, just having a particular degree, if I understand yeah. correctly, Prof, right? True. Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, Dr. Rizal, um, our Muhammad Badhun is asking, how would operating system be an important part of digital twin implementation? Okay, so, you know, when we, uh, you know, all of this infrastructure um, relies on some kind of an operating system, right? And because of how things are implemented on the cloud, you know, there are so many different approaches to this, right? So some people requires a serverless implementation, some requires a uh, uh, infrastructure, some areas requires just storage, right? Now, you know, as, a, as, as you work on learning about operating systems and how the softwares that run on it works, you know, you also have to understand at each layer, the type of services that, um, uh, um, you know, the particular software operating system needs to provide. So knowing this, then you would, you know, there's a lot of areas that you need to learn in that sense, right? So, you know, whether you're talking about serverless architecture, then how would you implement that? If you're talking about infrastructure only for networks, how would you implement it there? And, you know, this would obviously uh, requires different requirement of operating systems needs. And also, you know, it's a whole area on its own. Uh, if you have a chance, you know, get certifications on one area, it will be good for you. Um, then you can uh, uh, target in uh, one of these areas in cloud computing. So the, the role of operating systems looks like quite major in the implementation of uh, digital twins. It, uh, it, uh, yeah. Sure, sure, Dr. Zal, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it would, uh, you cannot run away from it, right? Because a software needs to run on OS. Uh, right. It's just that, you know, how uh, you would, uh, you know, depending on which layer you are, then you have to uh, know the difference on how it, it is being used. Thank you, Dr. Rizal. Uh, one last question for Dr. Maslan. Uh, it's a few questions that I'm trying to combine together because uh, they, they're aiming at the same thing. Uh, I think what they want to know is that uh, how do you see Malaysia uh, in 10 years from now uh, in regards to digital twin? Is that a combination of questions or a very <laughs> Yes, question? it's a couple of questions. I tried to just lump some of them into one. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I think again, uh, how do we, I don't have a crystal ball to see where Malaysia going to be in the next 10 years, but this is what I hope, eh? I would like to see what Malaysia going to be. We have been, uh, I think we have discussed it even with myself and Prof. Reza, uh, here might be a slightly different idea. But what I'm saying is that we have been in, in a consumer space. We are the consumers, consumer product, consumer nation. Yeah, what, what I mean is that 
a lot of products that we use today is from other countries, from other people. It's not the one that we really design. Only a few per small percentage that we design and we use it. What I was hoping in 10 years down the road, if we are you know, talking about IR 4.0, new technologies and all that, we want the talents to build our own technology and products, local products. So in, in, in 10 years down the road, I was hoping that you know, maybe we can become a producer nation. The one that can not only, not only use the technologies within our country, but we also become uh, the exporters of our own product in the future. Uh, that's what I hope it's going to be. But of course, again, uh, as I said, we shouldn't uh, you know, rest our, uh, relax ourselves just to learn things, but we need to produce and you know, design things. All right. Thank you. A huge thanks to all three of you for your valuable time. We know you have a very busy schedule, uh, but we are really glad to have you here and um, you know, explain some of the uh, hot questions or introduce at least uh, these concepts to the country. Uh, probably we will see in the coming years how uh, this plays out in the context of Malaysia, which is uh, you know, a developing country in that sense. And Dr. Mazlan pointed out that we have been consumers so far. So you know, can we go that extra mile now? Can we step up from just being a consumer to a producer you know, at, at that kind of uh, landscape? So once again, uh, really glad to have all of you. We wish there was uh, more time and we could more perhaps in the future, uh, you know, we can expound, go in uh, detail and depth about it. Uh, once again, I thank all of you for being here. I thank everyone who tuned in and anyone who tunes in later because there will be a recorded session that will be available uh, through our Facebook uh, page once the editing and everything is done. Um, so I hope uh, you are also excited as I am into the implementation of digital twins in the country. On that note, thank you everyone. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, saya, sekali lagi kami ingin mengatakan ucapan terima kasih lah kepada semua peserta yang telah mengikuti sesi webinar pada hari ini. Uh, diharapkan webinar ini dapat memberi pendedahan kepada semua tentang uh, digital twin tu. Dan semoga kita semua mendapat manfaat dari sesi hari ini. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum.